This is the CLM Broadcasting Corporation. Hello, welcome to News Hour. Uh, coming up in the news this evening, lawmakers ratified the declaration of the state of public emergency proclaimed by President Bill regarding rape and sexual violence. Conservation Society, CLM, and Partners and Forum on Effective Use of Land in the Country. And ACC ends a day's dialogue with banking institutions on the formulation of the national anti-corruption strategy. All these stories and more are lined up in this edition of NewsA with me, Francis Pallard. Government pensioners have held a meeting with the Minister of Finance, Jacob Jusu Safar, in appreciation of the position paper by government pensioners on the increase on pensions for government pensioners from 15,000 leons to 250,000 leons. The meeting was held at the Ministry of Finance conference room, Church Street in Freetown. Esther Marie Samra was present in our report. These were some of the pensioners who have served government in different institutions, including wounded in action persons, military personnel, and teachers, among others. Issa Koledumbia, on behalf of the pensioners, thanked the government for their timely move in adhering to their long call, but noted that pension increases effected in January 2019 were not equitably extended to pensioners receiving above 200,000 loans as agreed by government on the scale of increase for pensioners. He also said that there is no effective means of removing pensioners from the payroll when they die. They therefore recommend that the scale of increase for pensioners as agreed by government be adhered to. That consideration be made to extend free health care facilities to government pensioners, especially wounded persons, and many more. Minister of Finance Jacob Jusso Safa said, the new direction government is a listening government, noting that this is the reason the government increased the minimum wage of government pensioners. He called on them to exercise patience while they go through the figures and assured them of reviewing the figures and ensuring their concerns are met. And according to him, pensions are part of human capital development. Addressing the issue of pensioners is part of our human capital development agenda in the direction. So it's not new. And remember, human capital development are going to be new because not only on education, but on health and social protection issues. One category of the project which, which we are addressing on the human capital is the issue of pensioners. And that's very much consistent with our earlier effort, creating the social security, social trust, and now improving the conditions of welfare. We think the issue of paying pensioners less than 50,000 was a human rights abuse. He further said that if government pensioners are treated well with improved conditions, graduates will opt to work as civil servants. Acting Secretary General of the Salon Labor Congress, Max Conte, said they initiated the process and requested that the government increase government pensions, which he commended the government for. He said the situation of pensioners is deplorable, but maintained that they are happy for the approach the government has taken, which he described as a step in the right direction. Esther Marie Samara, SLBC. The Anti-Corruption Commission has ended a day's dialogue with banking institutions on the formulation of the National Anti-Corruption Strategy. The National Strategy should serve as a guide for developing a set of shared commitments across sectors to support collaboration within and between sectors and to direct renewed energy towards the goal of reducing corruption and building an ethical society. Here is the report with Maya Masuma. a fruitful deliberation as stakeholders in the banking sector, together with the Anti-Corruption Commission, came together to share ideas as to how the fight against corruption could be tackled in the country. Sierra Leone successfully implemented three generations of national anti-corruption strategies. 
the government's commitment to reduce corruption in Sierra Leone is articulated in the National Development Plan, SDGs, and the Constitution. In his statement, Deputy Commissioner Anti-Corruption Commission, Shirley Davis, said the current national anti-corruption strategy had expired since the 31st December 2018. He added that Sierra Leone is a signatory to various international conventions and treaties that commit the country to implement a range of interventions aimed at reducing corruption in the country. The financial sector is one very important sector when it comes to tackling corruption and illicit financial flows. Of course, there can be no transfer of illicit funds without the involvement of financial intermediaries. We all are aware of the many challenges that beset this sector. Chairman Technical Experts Team of the National Anti-Corruption Strategy, Mohamed Abu Sisi, informed the bankers that politically, Corruption undermines the confidence of the people in public institutions, erodes the capacity and legitimacy of the state, and makes a myth of the rule of law. He added that economically, corruption raises the cost of doing business, encourages inexecution of contractual obligations, facilitates the misallocation and wastage of resources, discourages foreign investment, and retard economic growth and development. In her contribution, a representative from the Sierra Leone Commercial Bank, Olainka Phillips, said corruption can be tackled in Sierra Leone if only to succeed in changing the mentality of Sierra Leoneans. She said one has to pay for every service one renders to the public, even in the banking institution. The issue of corruption in our environment is a cultural thing. We just do not want to do the right thing. For instance, um, if I walk into a bank, I'm using a bank because we're all and I cash a check and I walk away, the next time I come, I'll be in that line. The cashier will call somebody else. They've done that to me years back. And when I complain, they say, if they misbehave, they you know, give something up. I say, what? <laughs> I would not do it. And that is what is going on. So where, and then the, 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 the cashier would, or the person there would say, well, in every sabi for say, um, thank you. Why do we draw the line? Why do I have to pay extra, spend extra for, for a service I'm paying for? That is number one. I don't know how we're going to get around this. Others contributed that unhealthy competition within the banking sector can also lead a bank to be involved in corruption. They added most banks run behind government projects, and once they succeed in doing that, the politicians will use that to take loans without any collaterals. The discussions continue that for corruption to be tackled in any institution, it should start from the head of that institution, and that corruption is not only for private and public institutions, but also for the ordinary citizen. SLBC News, Maria Musuma reporting. Conservation Society Sierra Leone and partners have held a two-day workshop on land use planning for the effective use of the land. The objective of the forum was to provide a platform for a high-level policy. Statement from government and key stakeholders. Daphne Kimamakoli was present in our report. Improper use of the land has become a major problem according to institutions which have the mandate to protect the environment. Deforestation and encroachment into protected areas are man-made problems affecting the environment. This forum is to get the ideas of policymakers on environment protection and make recommendations. The objective of the workshop is to agree on a clear roadmap for developing a land plan for the entire Western Area Peninsula and to clearly identify and work with a multi-sectorial task force to coordinate Western Area Peninsula conservation. 
The land use plan will serve as a national land use framework for the government and also act as a pilot for a comprehensive implementation of the national land use framework. Minister of Lands, County Planning and the Environment, Dr. Dennis Sandy, said his ministry is responsible for all lands in the country and will continue to take the bold step that will transform land matters in the country. Of lands, housing, and environment is the political ministry, the competent ministry <coughs> responsible for the administration, management, and distribution of all state lands and by extension land matters in this country, regardless of where that land is, northern region, <coughs> southern region, eastern region, and here in the western area. This is why it is called the Ministry of Lands. Under the new direction, we are proud to say that we continue to take the most steps that will transform the face of land administration. The minister said ecosystem of unique species of animals have become extinct because of encroachment into protected areas, including water catchment areas. Executive Chairperson Environment Protection Agency, EPA, Dr. Fode Jawad, said the EPA is supportive of the land use plan as that will also help the EPA to perform its mandate. He said government is working on the National Environment Court that will prosecute and coach and people involved in unnecessary deforestation. Also, I would like to also take this opportunity to inform this August gathering that the Environment Protection Agency, in collaboration with the United Nations Development Program, just concluded a validation workshop on projects titled Sustainable Integrated Landscape Management of the Western Area Peninsula last month. And most or some of these participants present here today they are also in that participation motion. However, as a government institution responsible for the effective protection and management of the environment, EPA applauds the efforts made by the organizers to gather key stakeholders in the environmental sector to participate in this global conference. The executive chair said there is a need to recruit forest guards to carry out regular patrol to show boundary areas are respected, adding that forests are state assets that must be maintained and needs collaborative efforts to preserve. Tommy Garnett and Cleopatra Warite from the Environment Foundation for Africa made a presentation on the level of encroachment and the level of destruction of natural habitats. They also spoke of the land that we love movement that sensitizes people on the proper use of land and the need for forestation. For SLBC News, Daphne Kimamakoli reporting. The Cuba charged the affairs, Felix Raul Rogers Cruz, has paid a courtesy call on the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Dr. Ali Kaba, at his Star Hill office in Freetown. During the visit, they discussed ways of strengthening the existing bilateral ties between the two countries. Rose Conner Steven was present and she now reports. The Cuba charged the affairs, spoke on the duration of the existing relationship between Sierra Leone and Cuba. Mr. Cruz underscored the fact that Sierra Leone was the first country in Africa to have established diplomatic relations with Cuba. He informed the minister that Cuba has proposed tripartite negotiation with China to design and execute comprehensive programs for the control of malaria in African countries. He further mentioned that China has expressed willingness to fund the Cuban Malaria Control Program with equipment and training of their technicians in countries that will express interest in undertaking the program. The minister reaffirmed government's commitment to strengthen the relationship between both countries at both bilateral and multilateral fronts. He maintained that Sierra Leone has always cherished Cuba's support to its programs, particularly in the area of health and education, adding that Sierra Leone in turn will always support Cuba's initiatives when the need arises. Dr. Ali Kaba said the government of President Julius Madabio will focus on the new direction's major flagship program, 
which is the free quality education, to become a centerpiece of the bilateral ties with Cuba. He said as a government, they are aware that Cuba has made significant achievements in wiping out illiteracy as a country and that the models they use will be of benefit to Sierra Leone in achieving the education flagship program. He said they will work very closely with the Cuban government to see how they can implement their cooperation. In another development, the minister also addressed university students, pupils from various schools and internet users at a film festival organized by the Chinese embassy at Bintumani Hotel Aberdeen. According to the Chinese officials, the film titled Love is Not Blind Tonight, the film is an art that addresses mankind activities as it showcases different cultures. The eight films were selected to be displayed in four days to boost the cultural exchange between both countries. Dr. Kaba informed the gathering that filming is an art that does not only entertain but educate and inform nationals on relevant issues. He opined that Sierra Leone is grappling with challenges and the government, through the tourism and culture ministry, is making efforts to surmount the challenges and bring the film industry to an appreciable standard. A film festival takes a lot of work, but the outcome is always not only beautiful, but also groundbreaking for the audience and for the people-to-people -people exchange that is so essential in promoting common understanding and international cooperation. Therefore, I hope that the films line up will be one that will help you to smile and laugh and appreciate the culture and the history and social life and aspirations of people. And I'm confident that this particular festival will help to deepen our love for each other, to know that people everywhere have the same dreams. They want to wake up in the morning and be happy and get along with families and see how they live their lives, sometimes through transformation. Among dignitaries at the festival were the Chinese ambassador to Sierra Leone, Hum Pong, and other officials. In case you are just joining us, you are watching news are live on SLBC TV. Commission witness 14, Alf Jello, has told the Commission of Inquiry that an email tendered by him states that person of interest, Kausu Kebe, was in Dubai to confirm the existence of the 20 ambulances and airlift them from there to Sierra Leone. The Commission witness, Alpha Umaru Jello, was under cross-examination by the defense in respect of a contract awarded for the purchase of 20 ambulances in Dubai. Princess Gibson was at Commission 64, presided by Commissioner Biobel George Will, in our report. During a cross-examination by Defense Counsel, Pamomo Fofana, Commission 14 witness Alpha Umaru Jalo of the Ministry of Finance said the email he received states the Director of Finance, Kausu Kebe, traveled to Dubai to ascertain the existence of the 20 ambulances, inspect and airlift them to Sierra Leone. The email further states that Mr. Kebe negotiated a cost deduction from the initial $1,050,000 for the 20 ambulances. This, according to lawyer Pamomo Fofana, was a good step by his client for making government save $50,000. However, initial agreement for the purchase of the 20 ambulances was between Ministry of Health and Kingdom Security Logistics Company. What necessitated the involvement of Kausu Kebe in negotiations of the said ambulances, according to Commissioner George Will, will form the basis of his testimony during his appearance. Also at Commission 64, Commission Witness 17, Head of Credit and Administration, Serelian Commercial Bank, Abu Darami Kagbo, told the Commission of Enquiry that he is not aware that the bank has policy on unsecured loan. His testimony follows an invitation of policy makers of the bank on unsecured loan of over 7 billion loans that has been written off as bad debt. He also stated that he cannot tell whether the bank gave out unsecured loan after 2015, even though he has worked for 32 years in the bank.
Commissioner Judge will tell the witness that nobody is on trial by the Commission, as it is an investigation of the truth. No interest in knowing the truth and the facts. Nobody is on trial. So please, as you go, look for the facts again. When you come next time, I want to hear that you know much more than you knew today. <laughs> huh? Please, so that give us the facts. And if all the bank has done is right, that's what I would say in my recommendation. I will not go beyond what I understand from the evidence. But if what has gone on is not right, then we must make recommendation to correct it and to ensure that it never happens again. Am I understood now? So please, I beg you, I don't know, I don't know from the bank. I'm beginning to be worried. Right from the managing director to this one, everybody is two months there, three months there. Look, once you get into an office, start reading the files. Those the files. Know what is the position of the bank or the business you are taking over. Okay? So that you can talk authoritatively on them, even without taking responsibility for what has happened when you were not there. But you should know what happened, how it happened, and under which person it happened. Meanwhile, Commissioner George Will has asked the prosecution to present more witnesses for speedy proceedings of the commission. Princess Gibson, SLBC News. We're still with the commissions of inquiry. Three witnesses, including the acting managing director of Commerce and Mortgage Bank, Al Haji Fudikuma, have testified before Justice William Anan Atububa. All witnesses spoke about the landed property of CMB, for which the former managing director of HFC Mortgage, Ahmed Kamara, and former deputy minister of lands, Ahmed Kanu, were named in the transactions of pieces of land at Charlotte. Bobo, Gloucester, and Sungu Mukoyama villages. So Iba Samua was in Commission 67. Evelyn Brown and Ose Brown belong to the land owning family attributed to the piece of land at Charlotte Village, for which former Deputy Minister of Lands was named as having received money for. Evelyn Brown continued in evidence in Commission 67, presided over by Justice William Anan Atsuguba, where she informed the Commission that the property her father left for the whole family was negotiated for sale by the Ministry of Lands in 2014. She was jointly cross-examined by the lawyers for the persons of interest of Commission 67, Ibrahim Suri Kuruma and Alpha Ba, representing Ahmed Kanu and Ahmed Bakar Kamara. On the same piece of land at Charlotte Village, Osei Brown told the judge that his parcel of land at Charlotte was sold for 550 million leons, but that he only received 90 million leons. He named the former director general of HFC Mortgage, Ahmed Bakar Kamara, as the one who negotiated the sale of his said land at Charlotte. The acting managing director of former HFC, now CMB, Alaji Fode Koruma, made his first appearance before Commission 67. He testified in relation to, among other things, the investigation Commerce and Mortgage Bank carried out on all landed property of the firm. Most of the scores in the paper, the other procedures will be and specific mandate to be given by the court as to how it should be implemented. You might present the paper to invest in the property of X amount. The board will discuss and say, invest in X minus something, and this is the solution. If you go and negotiate again and come up with a price, say for example, let me give you a You said I want to invest in the property cost one million. The board views it and believes that the board of this property is around 800 million. And so we are approving on the basis of fact that this property got no government, we are putting people's money on the line. So the board will not say, by passing the project just to meet this payment requirement okay. or just to invest. I'm sure investment will like this thing. He added that after taking over from his predecessor, Ahmed Kamara, he thought it wise to do a thorough check on all property of CMB, including and not limited to landed properties. He told Justice Atuguba that after conducting investigations, he discovered that there are up to nine landed properties belonging to CMB, including Gloucester, Bobo, and Charlotte. Investigation is about some jurisdictions call it inquisitorial. Um, uh, so it's quite different from uh, adversarial. Uh, 
process. So you go direct to the issue and that advances the work of the commission. Chiguba has adjourned proceedings of Commission 67 to Monday, 25th February. Suriba Samura, SLBC, Freetown. At Commission 65, where SLBC's Maya Masuma was present, council representing the persons of interest, Lansana Dumbuya, asked the witness number one, Mori Lansana, from the Auditor General's Department to tell the commission who gave the instructions for the audit exercise that is now being looked as evidence in the ongoing investigations. As the cross examination continues in Commission 65 at the ongoing commissions of inquiry presided over by Justice Bankule Thompson, counsel representing the persons of interest, Lansana Dumbuya, has asked the witness number one, Mori Lansana, from the Auditor General's Department to tell the commission who gave the instructions for the audit exercise that is now being looked as evidence in ongoing investigations. In his response, witness number one from the Auditor General's Department, Mori Lansana, said that the 1991 Constitution gives the Auditor General the mandate to carry out audit functions of all government ministries, departments and agencies, and that's exactly what the department has been doing annually. He said he was part of the compilation of the audit report, but was not part of the day-to-day -day auditing of the MDAs. Council representing the persons of interest responded and asked the judge to take note that if the witness was not part of the day-to-day -day auditing, how will he be able to respond to some of the questions he will be asked during course examination? As the course examination continues in Commission 65 by Council representing the persons of interest, lawyer Alansana Dubia, most of the questions asked by lawyer Alansana Dubia were unanswered by witness number one, Mori Lansana, from the Auditor General's Department. According to him, those questions were not in line with the exhibit attended in the Commission that is a management scheme for 2018. He couldn't answer to those questions because according to him, they were not in line with the report. You will agree that since there is one a procurement committee, they are supposed to be in charge of all procurement exercise in the Ministry of Agriculture. I will not comment on that question, my lord. What I am saying, do you know any of the activities of the procurement committee in any institution? Do you know anything, whether they, 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 they do anything at all? My lord, I cannot answer that. Defense Council Lansana Dumbuya tendered a policy document on the management of the fertilizer scheme of 2017, which the witness had earlier said did not exist. Meanwhile, State Council Robert Kowa said as the public hearings continue, it is seemingly becoming clear that some witnesses may become persons of interest. What I did state earlier on, that whilst proceeding, we may have witnesses eventually being transformed into interested persons. And there is a likelihood that they may take us back to the start, bringing up issues, and they will start demanding, well, extreme fairness, which will stand to the disadvantage of state council, and so on and so forth. Justice Bankole Thompson said he will not like to give some kind of street direction to both counsel, so he will therefore allow them to dialogue and sort whatever issues they think could be hindrance to the hearings. Whether this witness who comes here to speak about auditing matters um, should be believed as to general issues which relate to marketing, pricing, of which he is not an expert. In other words, I'd like to learn a council. The hearings were adjourned to Monday, 25th February 2019. SLBC News, Maria Masuma reporting. This is News Hour live on TV. The Australian Road Safety Authority, SLRC, is clamping down containers carrying trailers, most of which have smooth tyres. 
jerrycans as their fuel tanks, which the authority says is devastating for the roads with greater likelihood to cause accidents. Patrick Salia has been monitoring the operations. At the time the ongoing operations started, 110 of the trailers were parked in queues awaiting their turn to deposit back the empty 20 and 40 feet containers. 89 of those containers carrying trailers had jerry cans at the side of the truck as permanent fuel tanks with some of the apprentices puffing cigarettes near the said makeshift now turned into permanent tanks. But unfortunately due to insufficient clamps by the Sierra Leone Road Safety Authority, only 53 of the trucks were clamped and later released with warnings for correction before they are barred from doing business at the port. David Pandanoa, SLRC Executive Director, says this enforcement should have been a long time ago. Um, the conditions of the vehicles at the port is, is a cause for alarm and concern, and that is why we were there to um, prohibit some vehicles and to tell them they cannot be on the roads or cannot use the ports if um, they're in that sort of conditions. They have to be uh, made safe. The vehicles virtually look like moving caskets carrying very heavy loads with other loads inside the containers being transported. Body parts are rickety with non-functional seat belts and other necessities obligatory to be heeded to as provided for by law, principle and practice. The SLRC boss tells me there are sets of standards that are being used by the authority which owners of these faulty trucks, including examiners and the port authority, are aware of. Um, there are many things, um, smooth tires, broken windshields, having um, side mirrors, uh, um, having being registered first of all, um, having sound engines, um, most of them that we had had. Um, fuel tanks outside of the cab. They're not using the actual fuel tanks. They're using um, the yellow um, 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 containers for for, for um, and so it's a defective vehicle. Um, they're just with defective vehicles. Ninety percent of them are defective. These trucks have bulkily formed part of the causes already gotten involved into the major road traffic accidents due to maintenance neglect. Overlooking the harbour where the cargo containers are collected and deposited every day is Mount Orel, hosting Frobe College, FBC, the country's citadel of education. And on its campus is the FBC primary and secondary schools. Simultaneously with the crackdown on derelict trailers, the SLRC has been holding dialogue sessions with authorities of the Frobe College primary and secondary schools on Wednesday and Thursday at community or parents' teachers' association meetings in order to address what apparently is the highest risk of children plying the Berry Street Frobe College route. Most of the children attending the school are almost every day loaded like sardines in taxis, the most available means for them to and from school. Mr. Panda's SLRSA is now left with several considerations for both quick fix and permanent solutions. Um, one of them is to, if we're able to speak with the SLRTC, to provide buses during the hours of schooling, um, in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, SLRSA, we're going to monitor. We have parties enforcing, enforcing the drivers, and so the parents know about it now. The takeoff point at Model Berry Street Junction, central of Freetown, is and has always been prone to accidents especially by oncoming vehicles from Mount Orel, and hardly a single road traffic law enforcer is seen at the growing congested intersection. After the 11 years war, followed by 18 months of Ebola epidemic, Sierra Leone is facing a carnage of traffic accidents, killing dozens every year. For SLBC News in Freetown, Patrick Salia reporting. The Inter-Religious Council in Sierra Leone has held a day's workshop at Chasu Hall, Kihama Road in Freetown for the implementation of the project titled Promoting Peace Building and Social Cohesion Through Religious Leaders in Post-Election Sierra Leone. Willie Mainabuku was there in our report. The Inter-Religious Council Sierra Leone IRCSL is one of the leading religious bodies that have contributed tremendously to promoting peace in Sierra Leone. It is not just a national institution, but an international body with support from various international organizations like UNESCO. 
in pursuance of promoting and maintaining peace in the country after the 10 years of war, the IOCSL was established under the leadership of late former president of Sierra Leone, Dr. Ahmed Tijan Kaba. In relation to that, IRCSL has organized a one-day workshop at Chassel Hall, King Hammond Road in Freetown, bringing together religious heads from various denominations in the country, as well as representatives from UN and other organizations. The theme for this workshop is promoting peace building and social cohesion through religious leaders in post-elections. Sierra Leone. A senior member of IRCSL, Al Haji Sheikh Abubakar, in his statement said that Sierra Leone is a fertile soil for religious seeds to germinate and grow, and that the implementation of this program will change the perception of people in Sierra Leone when it comes to matters of maintaining peace in the country. He added that Muslims and Christians have a common ground in social activities. Hence, the commissions of inquiry should not create a platform for violence and called on all Sierra Leoneans to maintain peace. Al Haji Sheikh Abu Bakar ended his statement by encouraging everyone to keep away from anything that will take the nation back to the 10 years of war. Um, to offer prayers. And uh, they sometimes, or most times, you know, come late in their intervention when the crisis <laughs> the inter-religious council, in fact, when the secretary was presenting our mother here, the day she exhibited her faith in Allah, she went. Unfortunately, after that boldness, an absolute faith in the work of Allah. Fifty of those children we are released. Secretary of the Interreligious Council Sierra Leone, Reverend Dr. Usman Jesse Fona, in an overview statement said that the UN system around the globe is expecting a tripartite cohesion in the promotion of peace, especially in Sierra Leone. He said that the establishment of the commissions of inquiry is the essence of implementing the project, as there have been rising tensions around the country. Reverend Dr. Usman Jessifona reiterated that IRCSL supports any system that asks people to give account of the stewardship as the Holy Quran and the Holy Bible accept such principles. He called on the government of Sierra Leone to work with them in promoting peace and tolerance. After the Lome Peace Accord, the role that was played by the Interreligious Council encouraged the UN system to see the value of religious leaders in the promotion of peace around the world. And for Sierra Leone, the Interreligious Council was given the nomenclature of being the moral guarantors of the peace in Sierra Leone. That was not a name that we claim for ourselves. It was given to us by the United Nations. However, IRCSL continues to maintain some of its major mandates, which is to pray for the country and promote peace and religious tolerance. SLBC TV will the minor book reporting. The Sierra Leone Grammar School Leadership Award Trust has been launched with the theme Empowering Young Leaders for Lifelong Trust and Responsibility. The Leadership Trust Award aims to promote and foster an enabling environment for students of the Sierra Leone Grammar School. The luncheon ceremony was held at the Sierra Leone Grammar School right in building Moritam. Esther Marie Samara was there in our report. the Sierra Leone Grammar School Leadership Award Trust. 
That was Dr. Modupe Tilopias officially launching the Sierra Leone Grammar School Leadership Award Trust, which is expected to capacitate pupils of the school at an early age in attaining their secondary school career. This initiative is pioneered by an old boy of the school, Dr. Eugene Tei, residing in the United States. The Leadership Trust will target scholarship programs, distributions of learning materials, and will also give financial and established a leadership prize to be awarded for prize-winning essays by the Ceylon Grammar School pupils. In his keynote address, Murupe Tilopias commended the former principal, Akiwande Lashite, for maintaining the standards of the school, attributing it to integrity, courage, vision, and passion. He encourages the pupils to make sensitive choices in becoming exemplary leaders. All of us, all of us are leaders. We don't get a choice about that. Let me make sure you understand this clear. This is very clear. The first person you lead is yourself. So you are a leader. Whether you want to be, like to be, you are a leader. The only choice you get to make is whether you are a good leader or a bad leader. That's the only choice you have. And the choices in being a good leader is for you to demonstrate integrity, courage, vision, and passion. You see, those values are very much aligned with the values of the trust, which you've heard before. Citizenship is about seeking the interest of others. Some pupils express gratitude for the establishment of the trust. It's a lot, and one word for it, I'm hopeful for the country. Because everything about the program is about raising the, the next generation of good leaders, and which is a good thing. And I hope to learn everything. The program will be starting next month, March, and I hope to learn everything it can offer. In our school, we are known, we are known for being leaders of different organizations around. And us, the generations coming up, we believe that we are to lead the other ones behind us. So as leaders, they have taught us that we must be responsible, we must have integrity, passion, and the drive for the leadership. The leadership skills development program will consist of debating and essay writing competitions, good governance workshops, among others. Esther Marie Samoa, SLBC. And from the Australian Grammar School, we now take some news around Africa. A report by cabinet ministers in Botswana has commended lifting a four-year hunting ban and the introduction of elephant calling. After months of public meetings and consultations, the report by ministers also recommends the establishment of elephant meat canning for pet food. The number of elephants in Botswana is estimated to be about 130,000, which some argue is too many for the ecosystem. There is increasing conflict between wildlife and people. Displaced people in northeast Nigeria have said they were transported through a dangerous conflict zone ahead of the country's elections in an operation agreed by the main political parties. According to media reports, the unescorted convoys were organized with the agreement of both the ruling and main opposition parties and the Electoral Commission. A Zimbabwean journalist has been detained over having a camouflage umbrella. Edmond Kuzazi was driving a car when he was stopped by soldiers who wanted to search his car. His lawyer, Obi Shaza, said that his client believes the soldiers wanted to bribe and when Mr. Kuzi refused to pay $100 Fine for having the umbrella, Zimbabwe criminal law prohibits the unlawful possession of any camouflage uniform. But from the African news, we now go to sport, and for that, uh, we join uh, our sport decks as the chairman of the Australian Premier League board, Emmanuel Safa Abdullahi, has said that the starting of the Australian Premier League board has created over 700 jobs for Sierra Leoneans. He made his statement during the press conference at the Ministry of Information and Communication. And 
Kenema, we had to wait. A lot of people had video evidence which we were waiting for. These were not official, we were waiting to see. Now, Kono is saying they did not invade the pitch in Kenema. Kenema is saying Kono invaded the pitch. Whose side would he take? So we've been waiting for video evidence, which we've now collected. We met and we have taken a decision. Kono has been fined 10 million rions. Five million for invading the pitch in Kenema, five million for invading their own pitch in Kono, and ha they have been strictly warned that the recurrence of that situation will mean they will not play any home game in Kono again. That's okay. the action that has been taken. That's that's a warning. They have to ensure that they <coughs> provide security. And this is taking me to the last question. The Premier League board is not responsible for providing security for games. This is the reason we're giving substantial amount of money to the clubs. The home teams are responsible for providing security for their venues. This is why when the league started, we had a conversation with them. Can you host your games? Yes. These are the requirements. Can you provide security? Yes. This is the reason why Chilema is fined 5 million units for not providing adequate security. It's not the Premier League board's position. In terms of relegation, we have we are still undecided on it, but as it is, the standard is that two teams will relegate. And one of those teams as it is is FC Johansson. And there will be one more team that will join it. This is because if, if we are able to get Wafa to get the elite, there will be relegation. Well, he is the chairman of the Australian Premier League Board, Imamir Saha Abdullah. Well, for the results for today is matches that's played in Bo and Kenema. In Bo, uh, Eastern Tigers and Bo Rangers played a one-all draw. At least Bo Rangers, they have secured one point after playing five matches. And in Kenema, it was a, uh, also a goalless draw between Cambo Eagles and that of Eastern Lions. And tomorrow we'll see where Port Authority will play host to Diamond Stars at the Apro School and also at the Siaka Steven Stadium. It will be a battle between the Freetown City Council guys and that of FC Calor. Well, with that, we'll bring, the end. So we'll bring an end to Sports Update on News R. And from sports, we now move to entertainment. The popular Tanzanian bongo artist Damon Platinum and Gavani has been accused of stealing the concept of the video of their new hit single, Tama. Critics were quick to point out that it has a striking resemblance to the US rapper Tyler, the creator's song, See You Again, which was released in August 2018. Fans are also saying that Damon Platinum and Gavani copied some scenes from the rapper's song. In the video Tetema, Damon has dancers in an ear, ear strip dress in red beret, white t-shirt and red pants with a plane in the background. Just the same as Tyler the Creator's video. The striking similarity between the two videos have raised eyebrows. There are discussion on whether to call it copy and paste or just borrowing a scene from what already exists. This is not the first time Daman has been accused of copying though. The award-winning singer's video Fire featuring a GM Bond, T.Y. Savage has striking resemblance to the U.S. singer Jason Diolo's song Swala. <laughs> In July 2018, he was accused of using a concept from an Indian actor, Shero Khan's movie, for the song Baila. He defended his act, saying that he used the concept because Khan is one of his role models. Damon and Rivani are yet to respond to the allegations.
Meanwhile, popular Congolese musician Kufu Olomide is facing accusation of rape of four dancers whom he held against their will in France from 2002 to 2006. According to African News, the 62-year-old musician is standing trial for allegedly sexually assaulting. Well, from that entertainment news, we now take you back to one of our headline stories. Lawmakers have ratified the declaration of the state of public emergency proclaimed by President Julius Madabu regarding rape and sexual violence declared on the 7th of February this year but the opposition APC challenged the ruling by the House Speaker. The notice of motion was made by the leader of government business, Honorable Mohamed Sidi Tunis, and was seconded by Honorable Martin Yuma, deputy leader of government business. Ibrahim Samoa has more. In their contributions, Honorable Martin Numa and Honorable Ibrahim Tawakonte of the SLPP said rape and sexual violence are serious issues, describing the act as madness. They emphasize the need to protect women and their rights, noting that they are in full support of the declaration of the state of public emergency. They said the proclamation by President Bill was done in accordance with the 1991 Constitution. <laughs> Honorable Daniel Kuruma and Honorable Usman Timbo of the APC said as a party they are not against the fight against rape and sexual violence but against the state of public emergency, stating that the rape situation in the country does not warrant a state of public emergency. They submitted for an amendment into the Sexual Offenses Act and to reinforce the laws. That as it is abundantly clear that this country is never the state of war. Ah. No, any state of invasion. No, is there any actual return of law and order? National Grand Coalition, Honorable Dr. Kande Yumkela also supported the amendment of the Sexual Offenses Act. He admitted that rape and sexual violence are deeply rooted problems in the country, supporting that stronger measures should be taken but frowned at the declaration of the state of public emergency, referencing other countries where there are rape and sexual violence incidents, but did not declare a state of public emergency. Number one, we in the NGC, we fully support an amendment. And that amendment, that amendment can include some of the issues raised by His Excellency, the President, so many of Anyway, a sentence between 15 and life imprisonment is more than a The second debate, the second debate which I hear, and we also had it internally in our past, is the fundamental question 
is a state of emergency proclamation. The best way to deal with the social evil. And we all have to answer that personally for ourselves. Honorable Indolo Givao and Honorable Veronica Kadistose of the SLPP said rape is not only a social menace but also a security concern. They appealed to their colleague lawmakers to support the declaration of the state of public emergency, noting that rape is on the increase, which they say should be nipped in the board. Honorable Veronica Kadistose and Honorable Givao said it's shameful having babies weeks old raped. Acting leader of the opposition APC Ibrahim Ben Kagbo said Honorable Mohammed Sidi Tunis, leader of government business, failed to explain the content on the state of emergency, saying that speaker could have allowed the House to vote. While Honorable Sidi Tunis said they will not allow the APC members of parliament to frustrate the efforts of the president. Honorable Dr. Abbas Bundo is the Speaker of Parliament. That we somebody the House approved the declaration of the state of emergency regarding rape and sexual violence made by His Excellency the President and published in the second Gazette Extraordinary in Parliament, I'm afraid we'll bring the cutting down for news hour. But before we go, our main points again. Lawmakers ratified the declaration of the state of public emergency proclaimed by President Bill regarding rape and sexual violence. Conservation Society, Sierra Leone and Partners have ended forum on effective use of land in the country. And ACC has ended a day's dialogue with banking institutions on the formulation of the national anti-corruption strategy. But that's all we have time for in this edition of Musa. On behalf of the rest of the team, I have been your presenter, Francis Bannock. Goodbye.